people are out in the field with you. So uh, we've got some uh, folks here from STL, the I-4 uh, uh, Ultimate Project. I'm sure you've heard about that in the last year so. And then uh, RCS, so from uh, Volker, who provides her uh, a specialist function. Uh, and then we're over to Michelle Mango and Jessica Eubanks. And then we're going to put this here a few minutes what kind of payroll and what it means on a project of this size? Hey everyone, Jessica Lee Banks, Paul Kirk, resident compliance specialist, one of two, <laughs> amazing kind of parts in the back room, the Andy. And this is Michelle Magra, certified payroll specialist, extraordinaire. <laughs> um, we've been using LCP Tracker on this project um, since early last year. We love the software. We think it's great, um, much better than paper versions of keeping up with emails. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do is walk you through the contractor side of things, the prime contractor side of things, and your CS role. So Michelle is going to start with you. Um, so the frameworks that you go through your LCP tracker account, and uh, you receive an email, and then with the link, you can um, log have access to the system and submit your token password. And this is what contract your screen looks like. If you have multiple projects, then you can, uh, your accounts will merge, so you can just select what uh, project you want to report for, and this is what it looks like. Um, again, everything is uh, automated, very user-friendly. Uh, I love this system. Um, the setup tab, there's where your training materials is, um, your support, live chat, um, e-documents, any, any documents that you need to submit can be managed electronically. Um, and the submission is an actual it's a easy one, two, three process. So I'm going to go ahead and set everything up as if, uh, just to show you what it's like. Uh, first thing you do is set your e-signature, and this is I received three notices. 
Let's check out what that is. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to answer record for a different point. No, let's let's get these notices cleared up. All right, here's number two. Remember, it's a one, two, three process. So there are notices. Yes, I have one notice. Let's see what that is. So go to notices. Oh, I forgot to put in the rows and the page of notes. Paycheck is going to be his gross minus his deductions. Final CPR. Okay, so as I see Taylor Swift, she is owner excluded. Well, let me verify that that's accurate. So then I go back to the e documents, the few documents. Here's Taylor Swift. Let's view the document. Okay, here is her excluded affirmation. It states that she does own 20%. Right now it's um, 410, 417, 424. You click it once, it doesn't change the actual twice. Look, it's in change. 
But depending on what you're looking for, you can sort. <coughs> we sort primarily by the beginning. Um, if we're looking for a particular payroll, uh, performing or non-performing work week, <coughs> um, or accepted if we're looking to pull up to the top of just the payrolls that we need to look at. So what I want to look at right now is this right here. This is a non-performing work week payroll. It looks a little different than a standard. So here is what we'll see if we track it. I'm looking 
looking at it, I'm typically going to look at the documents first. I'll show you that in just a minute and how we kind of process that in the easiest way that I have found to process the documents. But you're going to look at the certified payroll just like you would any other payroll. It's still certified payroll for the department. So you want to make sure that the contractor's name is correct we can date. The only thing that I've seen occasionally is a payroll number being duplicated. And that's why Michelle emphasized there is that line on when you're putting it in, don't look at the top and say, oh, that's the number it's supposed to be. No, that was your previous payroll. Make sure that you don't select that same number. It needs to be like that. Okay. So occasionally we get a uh, duplicate number. Can you tell them a little bit about which of the items are showing up on here on um, auto check? That is what we're going to process first in my office, only because 
there's no notification when the prime contractor uploads something or if a subcontractor uploads something. So you have to go look and see if there's something there. Okay, so again, I'm gonna, I know whose payroll I'm wanting to look at today. So I'm gonna put it in and load. And look, we have the documents. Um, what we have found easiest is, it's really easy when you've only got one page to see everything that's in there. When you've got 20, 30, 40 pages of the documents, you don't want to have to go through each one in order to get to what you're looking for. So let me show you a trick that I think is amazing. You see right here this upload date? If you use this right here, if there was multiple dates, and just twice just like you can on the other screen, it will pull up all the most recent uploaded documents. So if you consistently process your e-documents before you're looking at the certified payrolls, just keep up with the dates. And you can look right there, click twice, and oh, there's nothing new uploaded. So it's going to save you a lot of time when you have multiple pages of the documents. We're all about saving time, okay? Mm -hmm. Payroll takes a long time. So um, again, you can do your anything you already looked at, Taylor. Let's open this right here. Look, yep, yeah, that looks good. We got a date, information, it's presented, it's signed, it's not unsigned. It looks good. So we would go through and these were all new that we would process them. We've looked at that, we've looked at the payroll, we know that it's good. Again, we're just going to anybody have any questions on how that works? Good. So that's going to give us dinner today when we're thinking about your questions and thinking about upcoming work because <clears throat> the district, we really like this. It's a huge time savings. Um, and expense on the RCS end. Michelle and Angela's going to have spent an enormous amount of time working on this system. They work with um, LCD Tracker, who's this particular vendor, to do all kinds of updates and reporting features. And it's been a huge undertaking for them, and they've done an excellent job. And I want I wanted them to be able to showcase that with you guys. <coughs> Moving forward, our large projects, we're going to be including the RFPs on our design builds. So the Wakaiba projects in the lobby in this room, the companies will be bidding on those jobs that are coming up. <clears throat> this will be a requirement. Now, not necessarily else to be tracker. The department has a list of options that you can choose from. This tends to be the one that folks are going with. We also have I-95 and now Archer Western. Okay. So you guys are using this on, on your project also. And what we found, just to keep in mind, is that <clears throat> there's options. The contractor has options when setting up the system with the company. So you, your system's a little bit different than theirs and some of the features and stuff. So we learned a lot having two jobs going on at one time, which has helped us when we were writing the RFP for the new jobs. <laughs> they have lessons learned. One thing we all learned together, and Marla, Marla's in here also, MTM, they, they've been using this as well on the iPhone in the project. And one thing we've learned is that there's a lot of things that we need to be careful that we protect all of our interests in. And one of them being co-owners of the data, that's important. And, um, We'll work on some language to, to improve that. But I, just, I want to give these guys kudos because they have done a huge amount of work and effort to bring this project where it is and um, help us understand as a department where we want to go. So just was a little snippet for you. <laughs> this is a very, you know, very much more detailed. But how, how would you anticipate that we're going to be able to put those if they were not working on the job? How many people do you think we're going to need? Thank you. 
off the case, at least we don't see you track her. Um, and forget it. If you get locked out, if you have any problems, you need to ask somebody and get in touch with your prime contractor and they can set, they can reset it for you, they can um, put somebody new in the system, so contact your prime or good prime. Um, you can do that. Make sure that you remember that notices are not sent out from the system between the RCS and the prime if you're putting in comments. So remember that email. Otherwise, you're like, I put that note in there two weeks ago and you haven't fixed it. Well, if you don't tell them, they don't know that that note's in there. Um, there are a couple of really great reports that we have um, learned to love on this project. Um, the contractor's list report, the employee list report, the payroll details report, and the enhanced query report. And that's just, they're just listed in reports for you. Um, there, and then there's a lot of great reports. Um, from an RCS standpoint, I use these reports from LCB Tracker to help me with labor abuse. I use them for cuffs, because um, there's a lot of data that's there. Um, when I'm making sure that I'm getting a good cross-section of labor abuse from a contractor or a cross-contractor, those are some great reports. So I utilize those reports a lot. I know Michelle does when she's looking for like notices and things like that. We got do's and don'ts. Um, do check your e-document uploads um, prior to checking your payroll. That information may change how you look at that payroll. Um, don't forget to look for a yes for a final certified payroll. It needs to have final certified payroll both on the PDF version. That way if you have to send it or you have to print it. Also it needs to say yes in the column. So as an RCS, if you're looking and it's like, oh, I don't have a payroll, go see if there's a yes in there and you just didn't catch that. Um, and don't forget to select the audit button if you're needing to track which line items that you're tracking on a payroll. And some more uh, do's, uh, do take advantage, take advantage of the system. LCP Tracker offers such uh, training and support. They have a support staff to call, they have the live chat now, they have training materials, videos, documents, manuals live subcontractor trainings weekly. Um, there's just a lot of resources available, so do take advantage of that. Um, reach out to LCP Tracker for software questions, so you can you know, always contact your prime, but if you have a software-related issue, like um, I don't know how to upload a new document, that would be something that you can take on with um, LCP Tracker support, but if you have a question that's contract-specific, be sure to contact your contractor, because they don't provide guidance or project-specific information. Um, and also completely fill out the fields when uploading documents. Um, I know Jessica was mentioning the, the sorting. Um, so if you are trying to search for something and everything's not filled out, it's just it's harder to do that. So just make sure to save everyone some time and put in all the information up front. Yeah, we're trying to take over. Um, our biggest lesson to learn for me is um, making sure that when you're putting a comment in a comment with the admin box to make sure you put your initial or have some sort of way to identify who put those comments in because you may know today someone else is looking at the system or six months from now you're not going to know who put that comment in so make sure you put some sort of identifier we use just first and last initials for us um, look for duper quick payroll numbers just about everybody's going to do it probably at least once or twice they're just going to put the wrong number. So just look for that and um, don't breathe for a non-conforming uh, work week payroll. Before I am three is bad, but on a non-working, it's okay. The LCP tracker is going to do that for you. And uh, some lessons learned for us, um, treat every payroll with the first one. This is to our subcontractors and we can all get into a pattern, but um, remember payroll violations do get issued if there's errors and we're here at the prime on our project is you know, we do QC to make sure the payrolls are accurate before releasing to RCS, but, but do just make sure that you're submitting your information and accurately. Um, also be proactive um, between the RCS. Uh, they obviously will ask, so uh, just be open, transparent, also with the, with the owner. Um, you know, just have all the information available so there's no questions. Um, and um, also utilize the tools. LCB Tracker is a tool. The reports that it runs, um, the information that it captures is absolutely wonderful and we, we use it we use it for account safety and we use it for all you know, a, a lot of different functions it's a great tool any questions who has questions yeah Jessica you want to thank you guys very much I appreciate it
The other thing, too. Okay, this looks okay. So we've got to make sure we've got the supplements. I'm 
and you put that on there. So you all can catch one. The EOS law plus the supplement. Eventually it will be one page, but right now there's an extra sheet. Florida law prohibits discrimination. That's in Spanish and English. There's a notice poster. There's an employee rights under Davis Bacon, Spanish and English. And there's a wage appeals. Those have to be on there. One falls off, got to put it back. It's got to be up there throughout the life of the project. There are USDOL posters. So when their people come by, these are the ones they really want to focus on. They got to make sure you have your family and medical leave act. Rights poster up there. You got to have your OSHA, job and safety, hat and health. And it's a new one. They've got a new one. And the English poster is required. The Spanish poster is optional. A lot of your employees are mostly Spanish speakers. You're going to want to put up the Spanish one as well as the English, all right? We're going to leave that up to you right now until they put it on one sheet eventually. And then it'll be back because the other one was a one sheet for both of them. And the employee polygraph protections. So those three have to be up there for the, for the USDOL requirements. So the wage requirements, you've got to have your wage determinations. For the contract. It may be a high wage, it may be heavy. You may have both of them. You may have a building one. If you're building a lot of um, pieces of parts inside a park that's adjacent to your road. All pages of the wage determination have to be there. Again, <coughs> the last part of it is all about wording that they need in order to um, make some changes. Do not overlap, again, no overlapping. Don't use a you know, stapler and put them all together nice and neat, oh look, they're overlapped. Don't put them in a stapled sheet and, and hang your one staple here so they all fall and somebody has to pull them apart to see them. All right, you can't do that. Additional approved wage decisions, approved is important. Once it's approved, that's what you're putting up on the board, okay? Because that's, um, that's going to be what is part of your contract now, once USDOL has approved it. That has to be on there. There is a form that you can use now that, that gives you a chance to put in multiple um, classifications. So you don't have to, it used to, we have to put up a letter, you know, the, the USDOL letter that says, yes, this is a good uh, wage determination to be added to the contract. Now we get to put it on a form, it's a quick, easy form. You can have 10 if you want to on that one form, and it won't take up a lot of board space. So it's like fine real estate right there. The EEO officer list has to be on the, on the board. You're going to post the EEO policy and officer form. It is a form. It has information at the top. It says everything it needs to say. Don't re recreate the wheel. Form number's there. All right. The prime completes it. Post it. If you're smart, you're going to send it on to your RCS. Um, it's going to list contact information for the prime and all subs of 10,000 or more. You've got somebody down there that you, you've given a contract of $1,500, you don't have to put them up there. Some people do. Some Sometimes do put everybody up there. Everybody and their uncle. Everybody's on there. Others, just stick to the 10000 or more. All right? Because it lists their EEO officer. It lists the phone number. It lists the address of the, um, the contractor. And it lists, like I said, it lists that person's name. So it's, it's pretty important. What we, um, let me make sure that, okay. Um, on the EEO officer's list, you're going to want to follow the instructions of the form. Again, the form tells you what to do. All right. Subcontractors can be posted as the subcontracts are signed. Some do that. I'm not going to use my landscaper until the end, so I'm not going to put them on until the end. You can do that. Again, it's easier as soon as you sign that contract. Usually it's closer to the front of the project. Put them on there. Otherwise, you're going to be going back there, you know, you're changing everything constantly. Check it. But again, means and methods, that's your way of doing things as a prime, you decide. But again, inform your RCS, because that way they'll know. As soon as they hear in a, in a meeting, oh, concrete's coming up next, oh, they got to be on that board. All right. Um, the data, um, as submitted to FDOT, whoever you have sent in or your sub has sent in to DOT as their EEO officer, that's the name you want there. You know, don't give me someone you just hired yesterday. Someone who's already in the system with, with DOT. Now, if you hired somebody yesterday that's going to be your EO officer, you need to put their name in to DOT. All right? And make sure that the DOT records are as up to date as they should be. All right? Nobody wants to use old data. The prime can verify each name 
and the RCS will verify each name. All right? We're going to be doing it from the EEO officer list on the contract compliance page on the website. They now make it available. I don't have to call central office. I can just go here. I can key it up. All right, I'm going to check each name and the phone number. All right. You can use a local person's name. If I have a local one and, and my headquarters is in Tampa and that's the Tampa one is the one that they want that they sent into DOT, I can list both of them. But I have to list the one that is in, you know, on the, the file with EEO with um, DOT. And then I can also list the local one. Because the local one is the one who, you know, that your workers are going to know more. So it's, it's a good practice to do. All right, and it's available there. Okay, the poster must list the EEO officer that was submitted to DOT and can also list the, the local one. I mean, like I said, that's a good practice to do. So best practices, again, wage decision, sheets in a row, or at least in the same area. I had one where, you know, they had like, Two boards and the one page is going to be on this board. You know, an employee or somebody reviewing is not going to do that. It's, it doesn't make sense. So put them in a row if you can, as close as they can be. Laminate, I would laminate if you can. And staple through the laminate, not through the page. Or if you use a page protector, all right, we've seen someone they staple through the paper and then the rain gets in, even if you do it upside down. It's still because that staple makes an opening, right? So best practices, not through the page. Um, plexiglass cover, best practice, right? Of course, it, it should be easily, you know, opened and closed so that the person can make the changes. And uh, I've seen some where they put their company logo. I did on one of my first ones. The company logo takes a pack of plexiglass. Uh oh, now you close the plexiglass and you can't see what's in there. All right. So we we got to be a little more, you know, a little more aware of what we're doing. It looks great, you know, my logo's on that plexiglass, but. Now I've covered up what needs to be there. Um, you may take good condition, right? Um, I've seen some where you, you know you got to mow around that thing. So once in a while you can mow. I had one where there was like a, a dike, like water everywhere, and mosquito heaven, you know. And they, they came in right in front of me. I said, I'm gonna. I said the meeting today. I'm gonna be there to look it over. Guy came in front of me, slapped the board down in front of it. There's your bridge. Right. I, I had access, didn't I? <laughs> I had access. So, you know, maintaining good condition, everything around it, because believe me, um, you know, people are coming by. People do notice it. Um, it that's going to be said to you and remarked to you to keep it maintained. We don't want snakes around there. You know, I don't want <laughs> mosquito heaven again. We want to make sure we can see it. If the tree limbs are coming down and blocking it, it's making it so that someone's not going to want to go. I don't want to go over there. It's kind of scary over there. Spooky. There's nowhere. That's not the whole meaning of the board. We want to make it accessible. All right. Send the RCS a copy of your EEO post form, like we said. Keep that updated. All right. Someone's going to take a picture of it. I've seen you people say, oh, they took a picture of it on the board. Yeah, but when you stretch it up, it, you lose the quality of it. So it's much better to have it on the actual, actual form, you know, and send it to them. All right. Um, report to the RCS any updates that are being done. Hey, my guy noticed that this page fell off. We're going to get it up there as quick as we can later in the day. Fine. All right. So communication, again, is helpful. It's just helpful. Um, again, this is the last of the recap. Federal aid jobs, you're going to find them every one of them. No exceptions. Uh, fines installed and maintained within project limits. <coughs> you can post endangered species. You can put you know, other notifications on there. It's, it's not wrong to use that board as a gathering place. A lot of them you know, a lot of clients will do their, their safety meetings right there in front of the board. It's always a good practice. All right. They will be inspected monthly by the project staff. All right. And they will do it more than monthly if they're seeing that it's a real problem. We've had some, how many of you had stolen boards? We've had boards stolen. We've had the knockdown, right? You know, fire. <laughs> you know, different things will happen to the board. You've got to maintain it. You've got to make it uh, so that it can accessible and available throughout the life of the project. All right, July reports. This is the other, another um, EEO project related um, condition or requirement in the project, in, the, uh, uh, in your contracts. It's submitted by the prime and all subs, again, 10,000 or more that are active, 
on your project in July of every federal aid project. We'll find out what are monthly reports. Why do we do them in July? Because the FHWA has to submit a report to the U.S. Senate. And they want to use accurate data. All right? They can get it down to the district. They can get it down to anything. And they've got that information they need. July is the good weather nationwide. Now, we're lucky in Florida. <laughs> we can do it any time, we got we got good weather, right? But July nationwide is considered a good, a good month. It's known as the July report. All right? There's a big, long spiel, but we call it July report. All right? The reports, um, if you're inactive in July, you, you are inactive if your contractor is only July pay week started in June. We started June 30th and went through you know, July 6th or something like that. All right? They weren't active. If that's their only week, it's not. Because it has to be completely within. Every private subcontractor of 10,000 or more is going to submit it, active or inactive. And we'll, we'll find out. Uh, OK, so July reports. That's blurry. Again, there's a blurry picture. So I have to really take a picture and then try and blow it up. Based on the last pay period, they work in July, all right? Last pay period, the pay week has to fall all in July. First day of the pay period has to be in July, last day of the pay period, all right? Even if it's a Sunday or Saturday when you didn't really work, it's the pay period that matters, not the day they actually work. Oh, they only worked on a Sunday. Oh, well, that's not, no. It's the pay week that matters, the beginning and ending, all right? They have to be consistent throughout. So that's what they chose to do. Not based on a on your um, like peak work week in July. I had 50 people there that week, so that's the week I'm going to report on. No, it's, that's not going to help in the reporting cycle, right? Because they want the last. Like here is this month of July. All right, the pay period has to start and end between this. If your pay period starts here and goes on, that's not the week you're going to use. If you work another week inside here completely then that's the week you're going to turn in. And it's the last one. Don't turn me in the week up here if you work down here. All right? Your RCS will go up, up, up. All right? So it's the last. Go as far down as you can, but still be within the whole month of July. All right. Let's get quicker after you guys, yes. Um, this is what's going to happen for the basic process of the July report. So no, you said it's coming up, and it actually kind of is. It's coming up. The DCCM Dennis will issue a memo on July reports. All right, here comes the memo. He's heard from central office. We've learned everything. He's going to send out a memo. The RCS is going to forward that July report memo out to the primes. I'm not going to send it to every sub, because that's not my responsibility. The RCS is going to send it to the primes. All right. The memo will give detailed information regarding the due date, which again is August 20th, but again this year it's on a Saturday, so this memo might say August 19th it's due. So that's the reason we have to do this every year. We have to kind of send out to remind ourselves when that exact due date is. All right. And the July report form will be provided with the memo. We use FHWA form 1391. Until they change it, that's the, that's the form we have to use. All right. So we'll provide that form to you. We may provide it to you in, in some that was an Excel help or something, but um, you will get that and, and you can let your you know, subs know that everybody has to turn that in who's 10,000 or more. Um, the primes inform all subs, 10,000 or more. All right. This is going to be due. All right. If you have yours as a prime, yours is all ready, but three of your subs didn't turn them in. I'm not going to go to the sub, I'm going to go to you as the front. you, you got to knock on their door, you got to make sure they get got it done, okay? All right, the July report form kind of looks like this. It's got slots for, uh, let's see here, we've got black and, and African American, Hispanic, Latino, American Indian, Alaska Native, Asian, Native Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander. Two or more races, and then we have white. All right, that's all that one section. All right. Again, I don't know what you are. Don't make me guess what you know. As a subcontractor or whatever, as a prime, your, your employees will tell you what they are. You know? It's the same way as anything. I'm two or more races. Put me in that one. All right. 
Seriously, I'm not here to say, oh, that person's not here. His last name is Rodriguez. Are you sure they're not Hispanic? I mean, we're not here to do that. That's, this is based on what you know, your contractors know from their employees. And hopefully, as you saw with LCP Tracker, you're putting it in with each payroll. Or on a Florida payroll, you're putting it on that one. But if not, then you're going to have to just rely on the numbers that come in and, and the information. All right? Um, on the form, the one main thing, get this all the time. They'll send it right on the due date. Instead of before, right on the due date, and then it's not the sign. Yeah, I gotta make sure it's signed. Because that certifies it. So I gotta get that signed. So the preparer is gonna sign there and date it. Alright. We hope it's before the due date, because that way I got time to do my part here, right? Yes, what does this mean for this year? So the form looks like it's slightly different. This it it does because this is their form. You're right. Last year we've had, I know, we've had different forms. It's not even available on the website, on the, on the Florida forms, FGOT forms, you won't find it. It's not there. That's the reason we're going to provide it to you. It, it is available online, but again, you may have questions, or um, there may be some hints that we can give you, or you know, further information. But yes, this form is slightly different. You are right. Man, I can't put India over you guys. I'm telling you, that is good. Alright, um, sign and date, again. Major thing, might I get close to Okay, sign and date. Um, July reports, in the section here, is highlighted. Now this one's green. I don't know if it will remain green, don't no, quite change it to yellow, and then all my stuff is wrong, you know. But it's highlighted. And again, it has a zero. That means it's going to auto-fill from what you put in those other columns. So nobody needs to mess with these, okay? <laughs> but it has a zero, that means it autofills just like the, all the different forms we use for itself. All right? They will they'll populate as you put in. You can kind of test it. And you can start putting it oh, there, it's over there, oh, it's over there. All right? Male or female. All right? Now, again, the form may change. Who knows? We're up for another form, I'm sure. <coughs> but right now, we've still got male and female right there. And on this one, you can see section six which has, um, uh, okay, section six, the workforce data was all that, that information that we had there. Okay, let me make sure I'm showing you right. Okay, all of this area here is in table A, okay, of section six. One employee equals one category reported. Oh, what's that word? Category. How is that different from a classification? It is, isn't it? It's different. All right, one employee, one category reported. Remember, category, not classifications. All right, we're not going to change what's here. This is your craft or your category, your <coughs> individual, you know, um, item. Okay, but notice that there's truck drivers, there's line workers. You're, you, as a prime or your sub, have to decide where they go. And there is a list in the um, manual, the compliance manual, it has a list. Of here's your classification, here's your category. You don't have to guess if you don't want to. Right? It's, out, it's right there for you. And then here they are. We're not going to change them. I'm not going to add anything to it. It's an Excel form, and I can if I want to, but no. It needs to stay this way because it's being, you know, calculated with everybody else across the country. Alright? That would be fun to have. <laughs> Every district do their own thing. Oh my goodness. Um, Alright, so more than one category, you're going to use the most hours they work. If they work in two different ones on that same week that you're using the last week in July, and they worked on two different pieces of equipment, oh no, which one do I use? How do I categorize them? You're going to put them in the one where they work the most hours. Okay. If it's even, pick one. They can only be one employee, one category. Table A contains and includes all of the on-the-job trainees and apprentices. It, that other part that we saw there, all these other rows are here for trainees and apprentices, that's all included here. The other sections are going to separate them out and give them a, a little extra attention is what we're doing here. See these here, the apprentice and on-the-job trainees, and then down here in this section, apprentices. What we're giving here, male and female, we're going to give here some of the race information. Table B shows report by category and by gender over here. 
And then remember these, these numbers aren't going to populate. If you, if you practice with it, and you put a number in here, it doesn't affect what goes over those highlighted sections. It doesn't affect it. All right, because that's, this is being taken, extracted from this other table A. And you're going to have to put them here. All right. So are you saying they're going to show up in both? Yes. Both? Yep. They will. They will show up in both. All I'm doing is giving a snapshot. It's like, like these people don't understand that Excel, you can actually extract that if you want to, you know. But um, we're going to separate it out here. So they're over here, he's listed as a, you know, um, a black male. And then over here, I'm going to put him as a male. And then by the category, truck driver, net base, whatever it was, all right, as an apprentice or an on-the-job trainee. <coughs> and then when I go down here, this section, table C, is going to do the race and the gender. Same thing for these two. So on this way, they're capturing what, what information was allowed over here, because that's the categories over there, male and female. Down in this section, you're going to get the capture the race and gender, because the race and gender was at the top of that. It's just an Excel spreadsheet. They're just you know, having to use what they got. And then you put the numbers there. And again, stay away from the highlighted areas, those will populate. Same way here, it'll populate down. What do you do if you have sons yep. that just, you know, <coughs> Excel, they right. just can't get them to do it? I know we're not supposed to use Y now, but, you know, you'll have some that'll mark through to zero and mark the number. They, you know, just, yeah, they do it. I know, I know. It, it is hard. It is hard. They won't. Sometimes it helps if you know which week they should be reporting on. Say, this, you can tell them, this is the week I'm looking for. Even as an RCS, we know which week we're looking for. And then, you know, you get one, and like I said, it has marks out. Remember, anything, anytime you make a change to any form that's got a signature on it, you can't just make a change. You can't just make a, a mark. We know this in DOT land, right? You have to sign it, initial it, and date it because you've altered a legal document, right? You can't, uh, I don't know how to stress that enough, but you can't just, you know, come in there and, <coughs> and alter a document that somebody has signed. You know, that, it should be done. Once I sign it, that's done. But if somebody makes a change, so as a private, if you want to go in there and make a change, you know you can't make a change on that because the sub signed it. But you're going to check, you're going to get it back to them, you're going to say, hey, you need to change this. You can't, as long as it's neat, fairly neat, if not, tell them to start over and just you know, get it right. But, you know, you kind of know because you're looking at their payrolls. You know which week you're looking for. You know? and, if, and if you know your week, there was only two people working and they've got 20 people on here, what, what week were you looking at? You know? Those kind of things. If you kind of have it in your, you know, get a little head start, you know what you're looking for. And you can kind of look at it right away and know that you're right. You can't just, I know you don't white out. It's probably easier now that we scan a lot of stuff, but really you can't. The original document matters. And that's what you've got to keep on hand for your three years of the project. Um, on the job trainees, they're going to report on all three tables, like we just mentioned. And apprentices, they're going to be on all three tables. The A is the main step, snapshot of all workers, and then we separate them out. <coughs> so we know the race and gender of the male, female, and category. Best practices is the prime should review them. Okay, the sub sends something in again. You know which subs are the problem subs right now, okay? You know which ones you're going to have to base it a little more than the others. you got to take a little time. Make sure, you know, even when you tell them, you can tell them your deadline's a little ahead. So, you know, you got a little time to, to make up for it. Do what you, know, do what you need to do. Um, make sure the section C, number eight, the preparer has signed it. Okay, the preparer has signed it. Give the date in the section C, number nine, of course, they need to date it, sign it and date it. And again, you're on your own as a prime, you're going to do the same thing. 